Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is January 9th, 2023. Happy New Year. And we are so excited to be in studio. I'm here with my wife, Margie. Hey, Margie. Hey, babe. We are really excited for today's interview. Today, we are interviewing Liz Lamson. Hey, Liz. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Liz uh, has, you know, we always try really hard to make sure our interviews on Mormon Stories are with people who are wise and thoughtful and uh, talented and smart. And today is no exception. Uh, Liz Lamson is a Korean African American artist, musician, and writer. And along with her spouse, Sam, is a parent to five boys residing in Salt Lake City. Uh, she performs as a string bassist with the Ballet West Orchestra. Um, that's conducted by Jared Oaks. That's is correct. that right? Yeah, he's, uh, he's a director, and we're good friends. And he's Dallin H. Oaks's grandson, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as well as uh, the children's singer songwriter, Lizzie Luna, the creator of the music and movement program Yoga Storytime and Songs. Uh, Liz has uh, performed for um, and toured with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and the Orchestra at Temple Square for many years. Uh, she released her first album of original children's yoga music, Reach to the Sky, in 2018. Her writing has been featured in publications, including The New Era and The New York Times. Well, those are two different publications. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were many years that passed between those two publications. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of you may be familiar with her. She's not just a, a musician. Uh, as we mentioned before, she's also a painter yes. um, and uh, she is an active member of the Utah arts and C culture community, uh, formerly served as the executive director of the Utah Black History Museum. Um, I'm sure that will come up in our story yeah. with her. Her artwork is featured on Salt Lake City's Black Lives Matters, Black Lives Matter mural at City Hall. She is also an aspiring film actress. And in her spare time, she enjoys needlework, gardening, road trips, and Scrabble. Yes. <laughs> That's an intro. And I think uh, if I'm going to just sort of give a, a just another kind of preview of what we're, what we're going to be covering today, this is going to be uh, one of our traditional long-form interviews. It's going to be in multiple parts over multiple hours. It's going to be worth every minute of your time. But we're going to talk about her conversion to Mormonism. Um, as a biracial young woman and uh, trying her best to be a really good Mormon. Uh, that's going to be kind of part one. Part two is going to be her time at BYU, where she studied in the music program there. Yes. Uh, she ended up uh, getting married and having five children. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. That's going to be kind of part two and what it was like uh, kind of being an adult Mormon mom yeah. and uh, performing artist. And then... Part three is going to be her faith journey, uh, deconstruction, and kind of where she is now. And I learned about Liz because she recently wrote a really fascinating, uh, well-written and uh, profound letter to her uh, local church leadership in Salt Lake City that also was addressed to the top leaders of the Mormon church. Yeah, I'm not sure if it made it up there. I'd be curious to know. Yeah, but we'll include a copy of that letter because I highly yeah. recommend it. It Thanks. is reading for everybody. But without any further ado, Liz Lampson, welcome to mm. Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. This is this is very special. I I have to admit, I have actually never listened to an episode of your podcast. <laughs> uh, the only the only one episode that I have partaken of was my friend Angela Soph's uh live li like live taping she played she performed music uh it was at a church not a, not a Mormon church but mm -hmm. do you, I'm sure you have vivid memories of that but mm -hmm. uh but Angela and I used to be in a band together and she invited me to come watch and and then I met you afterwards and was like John I want to be on your show. <laughs> and you were like, so tired after this long, you know, session with Angela. And, 
and you were yawning and I was like, he's not, he's not interested. <laughs> he's not interested. Oh, I remember that now actually. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely do. <laughs> and I was interested, but I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. And, but you know, as we both were saying in our communications, it's, it seems like the right time. I don't think it was the right time back then. Um, you know, so much has happened in the last five years. Yeah. I had three more kids since then. So. And or, things have, yeah. Or no, one, one more. I had, I had the two, I had the twins before I met you. Yeah. And your faith journey has kind of come to a head in a way that it hadn't quite yet. Yeah. We've yeah. settled into a, an interesting place. Yeah. All right. Well, with, with that introduction, where does your story begin? And I'll say it probably didn't start as a Mormon story. No. So where does your story begin, Liz Lampson? I would say it begins with the creation of a young biracial baby. Okay. <laughs> um, my dad is African-American from Louisiana, um, French Creole. Even just... A, a week ago, or for New Year's, I made our family recipe gumbo passed down from generations, mm. seafood gumbo. Um, so I, I really cherish my Louisiana heritage that comes from my dad's side of the family. And then he was in the army and was stationed in South Korea for a time. And that's when he met my mother. And they came back to, he brought her back to the States and I was born in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Um, and then we, he was stationed in Germany for a time. So there is a, a an interesting, um, my family really cherishes German culture and German food and German things because we lived there and we actually lived there at the time when the Berlin Wall came down. So I remember being there as a kid, like we, we went and we were chipping it down. We had little hammers and spray paint and we were part of the, uh, that whole scene when the wall was coming down. So that's kind of cool. That's in my memory bank. Um, and then what was your dad's profession again? Well, so he, he was in the army and he, he worked with specifically at the time satellite communications and he uh, was an engineer. An engineer is a good a good title for him. So, but he retired in Colorado Springs. So after living in Georgia and Germany, our our family. I have two older siblings, so our family of five settled in Colorado Springs, where he retired from the army and began working as a civilian, still as an engineer, still in the world of satellites and. Um, government contracting and um, but I believe that he chose or they were it seemed from what I understand that they wanted to raise us in Colorado Springs partially because it was a a safe place to grow up and safe is another word for white. Uh, mm. He wanted to raise us away from his family. I think he grew up in poverty, had a lot of really, uh, just had a really hard youth. Mm -hmm. So he, one of his big things was being concerned about our safety. So we moved into a safe neighborhood in Briargate, the Briargate community in Colorado Springs, kind of the north side of the city, uh, and near the Air Force Academy, which is actually where my brother ended up going to school, kind of following in my dad's footsteps, joining the military. But, And that's the base that we would go to to shop at the commissary and go to the BX and go bowling. And we'd go to the uh, the Air Force, the, cha the, the chapel there. Do you know that iconic chapel that, that's mm -hmm. at the Air Force Academy? It's mm -hmm. It's like... It's like an A-frame chapel, very pointed, kind of metallic. It's uh, You can see it like sitting on the mountainside. It's sort of like the Air Force Temple, mm. <laughs> the military temple. It has a, a really unique architecture, and it's just an iconic thing. And, and that is actually where we would go for like Christmas Mass. 
So was your dad raised religiously at all? Or? So his side of the family was Catholic, very deep Catholic roots. Um, so we, so black Catholic from Louisiana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't particularly religious. On the other hand, my mother was, or became very religious. Tell us about her background. So she was from South Korea and she, we'll, we'll get to this later, I'm sure. But, uh, that's where she's from. And I guess as a little teaser, I think that's where she is now, Mm -hmm. but I don't know. So Mm -hmm. we'll get there. But, uh, yeah, she was much younger than my dad. Uh, I think 12 years junior, his junior. Um, just a beautiful was she, was she raised, woman. Where was she raised? She, she was raised in Korea. Okay. So he, when he was stationed there, she was maybe 19, mm-hmm. and he met her there. I don't know if she even spoke English, honestly, when they met. Maybe a little. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time I was born, I was the youngest kid, so her English was better. But she was clearly like Korean. <laughs> okay. And which oh was just the flavor of my childhood. I think we ate so much Korean food. I mean, that was just what we ate because she was the one who cooked for us. Um, so our staples were like, um, oh, just rice cakes, duck bulgogi, kimchi, um, spam. Bulgogi? Yeah, yeah, she'd make bulgogi. Um, we ate really like strange things at the time that now I look back and it was normal to me at the time, like like cold octopus legs. And I used to eat those as a kid and think nothing of it. And now I think about it too much. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's kind of like a little suction cup there. <laughs> I don't know about it. It's kind of chewy. I don't know about this. Or like, uh, anchovies. We do like little lettuce wraps with rice and gochujang on top and then like dried anchovies. And it's like, that's a, that's a small fish and we're eating its bones. Mm. Like we're eating all of it mm. in a little, little, uh, or, dehydrated squid or um, pickled turnips. Uh, Gimbap is the Korean, uh, I guess you could call it sushi. It's a little different, but, you know, uh, meat and vegetables and rice wrapped up in seaweed. And, um, oh, spam fried rice, spam spam slices dipped in egg, fried in a pan, served with rice. And then rice, this is, as a kid, this was just, uh, this was the equivalent I'd, I'd say of cold cereal. We'd eat leftover rice with cold water. So cold rice in cold water. And then we'd tear up pieces of American cheese and sometimes like deli ham on top and just eat rice and water. You just, we just call it rice and water. Mm. And, uh, it's a way to use your leftover rice unless we were doing spam fried rice. And I grew up with rice and milk, like really? for breakfast. Did you heat it? Or was yeah, it, it was cold? heated. It was oh, heated. Yeah, yeah. Just try some cold rice and water. That really I've like never chalky, heard of that before. grainy. You know, <laughs> cold rice is is not. Uh, it's not chewy or soft anymore. Um, and then were you know, either of your parents college graduates? No. Okay. No, actually, I know my dad dreamed of going to college and being a scientist, but again, he came from a very poor family. And uh, joined the military kind of as a Mm. way of advancing in life. Were either musical? My mom had a great voice. I always wonder if I heard her voice now, if I would recognize it. But I try to remember what it sounded like. But but she had a great voice and we would we would say, Why don't you sing at the church? You know, but she'd sing at home. Um, but she loved uh, she loved music, and my dad did too. We were raised on the Temptations, Motown. the Temptations. Mm. <laughs> um, oh, what's a Temptation song? That's a My Girl. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There's one that was really touching. Into Prada Beg? Is that the Temptations? 
I'm going to goof if I try. <laughs> we should. <laughs> oh. oh, they're just really, really, really great music. I, I don't know why I'm spacing, but there's one that I heard recently that was so touching to me. Anyway, um, Temptations, Michael Jackson. Um, kind of more like Motown music. My dad was really into cars. He had a 69 uh, Plymouth Roadrunner. <laughs> that was his little baby. Mm. Anyway, yeah, my parents were so different from each other, so different. And then they created three children and we were so different from them. So we were just this batch of people who had the fact that we lived together <laughs> definitely, you know, brought a sense of commonality. But my parents' cultural backgrounds were so different. And so I, I still struggle with trying to define my own identity, I still hesitate to just call myself a black woman. That's everyone refers to me that way uh, since I moved to Utah and especially since 2020 when George Floyd died. But um, growing up, I, I never was called that. My dad didn't call us black kids. He, he really wanted to remove us from black culture and his black family were they trying to assimilate into white culture as much I, as possible? Yeah, definitely. We were given very traditional white names. Elizabeth, like the Queen of England. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was the option when I was, when we were really young to learn Korean. And nowadays it's great to be bilingual. People put their kids in... In, in language immersion schools so that they can learn another language. They, they go to school in another language. But at, at this time in the, in the 90s, early 90s, I was born in 1986, but uh, I mean, at that time, it wasn't, it was in my dad's early lifetime that interracial marriage was made legal, like the Loving case. Mm -hmm. right. Like it was, it was unusual for him as a black man to have married an Asian woman period. Mm -hmm. So, and he was really trying to, to overcome his uh, past by raising us in a, in a new way. Uh, but, did you, but did, did you say he raised you guys religiously? You did attend church or? Yes. Yeah, so we, we did attend the Catholic church real quick. I just wanted to say that there was the option for us to learn Korean as kids. And they decided that that might confuse us in school. So we didn't learn Korean. I think my mom was like really, really wanting us to learn Korean. So she would speak to us in Korean. She'd pick me up from school and ask me, how was my day in Korean? What happened at school in Korean? And I would, I would, I would understand and I would answer her in English, but unfortunately I never learned the language. Um, but, but yes, we, we attended a Catholic church uh, at the Air Force Academy. That was the building you were talking about. Actually, so that chapel, that, that iconic chapel was for like special services. Okay. So Easter, uh, Christmas, the midnight mass. Um, my siblings were altar, were altar boy and altar girl there for Christmas. But there was another chapel uh, on base um, where we would do our Sunday meetings. And I had my first communion there. I wore this giant, what looked like a wedding dress for an eight-year-old. I was at eight. Is that when they do it? Communion? Yeah. Might have been 13 or 14. No, this was, I was oh. very young. Okay. Yeah, because by that time, I was, I was getting into Mormonism. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I think it was around when I was eight hmm. um, when I did my first communion and wore this giant puffy dress. But my mom, somewhere around that, probably around the same time, started getting really, really invested in her own church. And I believe it was a Korean Methodist church, mm. but a, a really intense evangelical church. And, you know, what I learned just recently is that in the early 90s, Colorado Springs had this, uh, made this effort to bring like, like, what would you call it? 
um, like enliven the community by enticing people to move there. There was an effort to to bring in nonprofits, and as a result, uh, a bunch of churches, like evangelical churches, moved into Colorado Springs, the mega churches. It's like the mm. mega church capital. Oh. And it was all starting to grow when I was a kid. And, and so my mom was getting pulled into, um, a culture. It was, it was a religious fervor, probably much like when Joseph Smith was a kid. I, I identify with Joseph Smith so much as a kid, like, uh, oh yeah. Confusion. Yeah. Like, but, but I mean, even in his, at his age, all these different churches, everyone trying to kind of sort of competing, uh, all this, um, all these ideas that, that mm, different doctrines, dogmas flying around and, and, uh, preachers here and there televangelists is it, it, it that I imagine that what was happening in Colorado Springs was very similar to what was happening in uh with upstate New York in Joseph Smith's time just religious fervor so my mom got pulled into a Korean church and she probably had been going there for a long time it it was I mean, as we know, church is where you find community. And for her, being from Korea, that's where she could be with her Korean people, where she could go and and be with people who looked like her, who spoke her language. They'd have potlucks. I, I remember going to these potlucks of just tables of piles of Korean food, which is magical. Mm. Uh, the Sounds smell, good. Sounds yummy. the, um, and then mm. all the people and the children and, and it's, you know, it's like when I would go there, I didn't look Korean enough, so I didn't feel like I quite fit in. And then when I would be with my dad's family, I just remembered going to one family reunion cause we, he, he in really, Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah. And we didn't keeping, you know, he, we were, had very minimal contact with his family, but I remember going to that reunion and being really overwhelmed, seeing a whole group of black people who I think probably looked like me more than I looked like my mom. Um, cause there were some, there were also some interracial couples, so some more lighter skinned, um, black kids and adults uh, but even, but in that crowd too, I also felt like a stranger and uncomfortable. Mm. <laughs> so I was always trying to find my place and, mm. and trying to fit in mm. and find a community of my own, which we'll get there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what was it like growing up, particularly now in this predominantly white community when, you know, a large part of your identity was biracial? Do you have any memories, particularly as a child, or what you felt, or if that it, I mean, if that's the case? Yeah, I, I, I remember a moment when I kind of realized how different I was, um, and a lot of my experiences grappling with my racial background come back to my hair honestly like mm -hmm. I have this afro and uh my siblings don't interestingly enough so I look I I pass and look more black than my siblings do and um but I remember my mom had a friend over a white woman and she brought her son we were like five or six and she gave him he was sitting next to me and he just like loved my hair and he wanted to play with my hair. And somehow he procured a comb and he was trying to comb my hair and it hurt. Like it, you can't run a comb through this stuff, you know? And he was trying to comb my hair and I looked at my mom like, like help, like this is not, this is not okay. You know, 
Um, but she and this woman were like looking at each other and smiling and laughing like, oh, this is so cute. This little boy's combing her hair. But I remember at that point feeling like that was when my hair became my enemy. And, uh, I'll, and then my mom, my parents, before I started kindergarten, decided to start straightening my hair, relaxing it, like chemically relaxing it. Um, she didn't know how to take care of it. My dad didn't know how to take care of it. So the easiest thing was to chemically straighten it. And that was kind of a way for me to f- fit in a little more in the white community by doing my hair the way that white women do. And that's still a thing. I mean, you know, Michelle Obama straightened her hair when she was the first lady and she's like rocking braids now and all these different looks. And she has stated that when she was in the white house though, she didn't feel like people were ready for that. Mm. Um, and there's like this look, you know, this more conservative look. Um, even now I've found as I've been getting into film acting, I used to have braids like faux locks and kind of a dreadlock look. And I didn't book any gigs when I auditioned with that hair. And then the moment I took them out, I started booking stuff. Interesting. So, um, hair, hair was a big part of my, uh, childhood experience and, and the way that I saw myself. But, um, generally though, like what's great when you're a kid, like kids don't care so much. We just want to play. We just want to hang out. We don't think about it too much. We're not like super aware of like where, where our parents really came from. We mm-hmm. just know where we are yeah. at the moment. So I was really oblivious to uh, all all things, um, mm. or, or or not all things racial, but but I I I know I was different, but I, it, I didn't process it until much later in life. I think another question just about you as a girl, like if you remember things about yourself, how do you remember yourself personality wise? Um, oh, or yeah. how do you visualize yourself, uh, growing up? Like, are there things that you particularly remember yeah. about your young self? I was so, so shy, like so shy and quiet. Um, I just didn't speak. (laughs) And that lasted till I was in high school. Like I remember being in an art class when I was a little older, but um, being someone asking if I was deaf or mute because I was so quiet. (laughs) So... um, yeah. What, what I, was that about? What do you remember about that? Were you an observer? Was it, were you, was there fear associated with speaking? Um, it may have been a result of the way my mother raised us. It might've been an Asian culture thing where sort of that don't speak unless you're spoken to sort of thing. And like uh, mm. children are to be, my dad would say seen and not heard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't that extreme, but I think that the way that my parents disciplined us made a huge difference. I was, I was afraid of my parents and I always needed to be in line. I always needed to be doing the right thing. And then I, and I also don't know if like my dad's paranoia, uh, trying to keep us safe. Maybe that instilled in me like a fear of strangers as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure. I, I was just very, very quiet and introspective. And I guess that's still a part of my personality and probably what contributed to my development as a writer, because my thoughts are mostly in my head. I think in words. In fact, I felt like when, when the opportunity to do this interview came up, I thought I had a choice to say yes or no. But then as a few days, as days passed, I felt like I no longer had an option. Like I had to do this because I started talking to you in my head. (laughs) Like I'm one of those people who has like a script 
kind of like when you're watching the news and there are like words going by. Um, and I, and I, it just occurred to me recently that not everybody thinks this way. Not everyone can see like, uh, colors or pictures in their head, I guess. And, and some people don't think in words, but I'm usually talking to someone almost constantly in my head. And sometimes the character that I'm talking to changes. Sometimes it's, a therapist, sometimes it's a friend. If I have an important conversation coming up, it's whoever that person is or, um, anyway, but you've been sitting in my head for weeks now and I've just been saying, just talking to you. And, and, and I realized this is not going to stop unless I actually talk to you in person. (laughs) Like I will go mad. Like, and that's the story of me as a creative person generally. Like there's, there's sort of a, like maybe a seed of something and it starts brewing into a storm and there has to be, uh, it has to rain at some point. <laughs> there has to be a pressure release. There has to be, um, it has to come out of my head somehow <laughs> or it'll keep brewing. So was that true when you were younger too? that creative brewing when you look back? Yeah, I was, I first my the first skills that I developed in the art world were as were, were visual art. I, I was kind of known and actually elementary school, middle school, high school as a, as an artist, like a visual artist, drawing, painting mainly. Um, I wasn't as much into writing until my, writing skills developed but I was always creative coming up with things I think as a as a young girl it was most clearly manifested in imaginary play um I my best friend when I was a little girl she and I would have sleepovers and we were Often we were mice and we would build a nest with blankets and we'd go on adventures as mice. At school, we had this great game in third grade that I loved and we'd play this at recess over and over. But we would play Mount Vesuvius (laughs) and we would be running away from the exploding volcano, Mount Vesuvius. We had an imaginary pet lion named Harry. We would escape from the ashes and the the toxic fumes, we'd make it to the shore, we'd get in a boat and we'd, (laughs) we'd row away to safety, things like that. (laughs) I'm loving it. (laughs) Love the imaginary play. Can I say, it sounds like you had a really, um, a well-developed inner world. Yeah. As a child. Is that true? Oh, it's, I mean, it's hard to look back. Because, you know, all you know is what you know. I don't know what Mm. other kids were thinking at the time. Um, I did gain a reputation very early on as being a smart, smart kid. Mm -hmm. Like I I skipped third grade. So I went to to fifth grade as a nine-year-old where the rest of the class was 10. And that set up an interesting dynamic as things went on, um, you know, I was always younger than everyone in my classes, but I was tall and I developed kind of went through puberty and, and adolescence sooner than most I'd say. Um, but you know, by the time I got to high school, you know, people would, people were driving before I was, or people were, dating before I was or um so I think that and also influenced my kind of shyness because I was different I was not only different because I looked different but I was different because it's like that's Liz she's the girl who skipped a grade and um everyone knew it like she's she's only nine you know and everybody's 10 and 11 or like when I was when they were 13 and 14 she's 12 you know so if you were to describe a bit of what your family culture was or what it felt like kind of being in your home for you in particular, um, mm-hmm. is there a way that you would describe that? 
Uh, it was not great. We were very emotionally stifled. We didn't talk a lot. I mean, maybe the fact that there was a, a kind of a language and cultural difference between my parents. We weren't like a cuddly uh, fa family. We weren't like, uh, we weren't like the white families <laughs> that my friends had. I'd go to their houses and it was like a totally different vibe. And then both of my parents had really, really bad tempers. And I was afraid of them. So it wasn't, I don't know. I have, I have a lot of icky mm. memories. <laughs> I wasn't a super happy kid. It was kind yeah. of a, I mean, in middle school, um, People called me Eeyore. Like I was identified with, with Eeyore, like the, 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 from Winnie the Pooh, the blue sad donkey <laughs> who's always like, oh, um. <laughs> oh, 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 no, it's not, oh, bother. It's Eeyore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, just like, mm. thanks. Oh, thanks for noticing me. Oh, that's me. right. Thanks for yeah. noticing me. <laughs> so, um, I guess I'm curious. I know your mom. Your mom's story is going to come into play, but also oh, your yeah. church. Yeah, your your uh, your conversion to the church. So where should we go next? Oh yeah. Okay. Let me tell you about about uh, the religious explosion in our home. So and and this leads this this yeah this is a turning point. So there's a point where my mom was like, I don't like the Catholic Church. I don't want to go there anymore. Um, but my dad didn't want us to go to her church cause it was like super intense. And so we did that thing where we went church shopping and we just kind of went to different churches and there were so many options in Colorado Springs at the time and new options popping up all the time because churches were still moving in focus on the family was taking off there. Um, and we settled on a Baptist church with a rock band where we could wear jeans and we would go and we'd sit in the very back row of the balcony. We would not, we didn't get to know anybody. We were just in the background. It was sort of this, maybe their compromise of sorts. Like, okay, we'll take the kids here. It's not her church. It's not his church, but it's a church where they'll be exposed to like good moral principles and they'll have that experience. And there's nothing to, too threatening about it. Um, so that's, and that, and that's a point where I was like, mom, you should sing with the, with the Baptist, like the band, like they had the little, they'd have the, um, the three backup women singers like swaying and like adding the harmonies, you know, and I was like, you could do that. Um, oh, and at the same time, um, I was learning to play the bass when I was eight. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was going on this, this religious, these religious shifts were happening. Um, but I learned this later and I didn't know this at the time, but it sounded like my mom's religious fanaticism was affecting, uh, both her relationship with us, but it was becoming a, a thorn in the marriage. Um, my dad later told me that she was starting to like squirrel away or take money, like some of the family's money to give it to their church, to her church. Um, she started having this desire to become a missionary for her church. Um, and she and my dad were arguing a lot behind closed doors and she was crying a lot. And, Oh, this is, I didn't mention this, but she, she was so religious. We had a prayer room in our house and every morning we would do like a devotional in the morning we would pray and, and, and at night we would pray. We couldn't wear, uh, we didn't wear shoes in the house because 
it's an Asian household. Koreans don't wear shoes in the house. But we definitely could not set foot in the prayer room with shoes. And uh, she would, we would read uh, from the Bible. She started doing um, Bible study groups at our house. Um, she wouldn't let me, like, me and my friends, like, at night, like if I had a friend sleep over, we'd still have to read the scripture passage of the day. And I remember once having to read like one of the longest Psalms, one of the longest chapters in the book of Psalms with my friend. And we're just like lying on the floor, like dragging ourselves through this Psalm so we can get like move on and like play as mice in our nest, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but she, I, I remember watching her so there were these french doors on the prayer room so like kind of a sheer white silk curtain and i remember like peering through one time and seeing her kneeling on the floor like rocking and sobbing and just like like snot dripping off her face tears mm. just like shaking crying praying and this was just about the time before she left. Mm. And I think, I feel like I was watching her process the decision, mm. do I need to leave this family? And I, so I, I think she was tormented. She didn't, I mean, who, something was so, something was going on that motivated her to abandon ship. So we were, I, I remember her beginning to make a lot of food. She, she made these big pans of food. Like uh, there was a, a big pan of bulgogi. There was a big pan of cha jengmyeon, which was one of my favorite dishes and still is. It's like a, like a black, a, a sauce, a salty sauce made of fermented black bean paste um, with, pork and vegetables and it's it's sort of served like spaghetti you put this like chunky salty sauce on top of um uh, noodles and she made a big pan of that and one of her bible study friends or had this weird american recipe that we all thought was so unique like chicken or turkey tetrazzini and it was like some cas casserole with turkey and mayonnaise and cheese and stuff and we were like this is this is so strange and so she made that anyway so she started like loading up the freezer with these big meals and we're like what's going on you know like and it turns out she was planning to go away for the summer to go back to korea and visit her family or at least that's what we were told but the thing is we took her to the airport my brother remembers her saying something like, like, uh, we'll see if you guys miss me at all or something, something passive aggressive like that. And, mm. and she got on her plane and she went away. How old were you? Just I was 10 at this point. I was 10. I just, I had just turned 10. My birthday was on May 3rd and she took her flight on May 25th and I never saw her again. We never saw her again. Wow. And I've never talked to her since I, she sent a few cards and like a Christmas package with a bunch of little Korean trinkets and cute things. She sent me this like, uh, goofy from Mickey Mouse, like Mickey Mouse goofy <laughs> shirt, um, that I wore all the way into college. Um, but the cards kind of after about a year, like we stopped getting cards. And, and then when I went back to look at the cards, I started wondering if the birthday cards were from my dad, actually just signed from her or from mom and dad. So if I could ask, and this may be impossible to convey in words, what's it like for a 10 year old girl to have her mother completely abandon her? It's, what was it like for you? It's horrible. It was horrible. I mean, but, but it's, it was unusual because initially I was relieved that she was gone because again, she had a temper, both my parents did and she, her expectations for us, she was sort of, I hate to say it, but like a stereotypical Asian tiger mom who expected us to be absolutely perfect. 
Um, so, you know, I, I remember a time when I brought home a stack of math papers from fifth grade and I got whipped for every B, mm. anything that wasn't an A, I got whipped for it to the point where I like collapsed on the floor, like, mm. like crying in pain and like just you know, like wanting it to stop. But, but that's, I mean, what set me up for like, she set me up to be a perfectionist, Mm -hmm. which didn't play well later down the road when I was trying to be a perfect Mormon. Mm -hmm. But, um, so, so when she left initially, I was relieved because my dad, on the other hand, didn't have the same kinds of strict expectations Um, as far as like having perfect grades and being top of the class. And, you know, it was when she was still around that I skipped a grade and it's like, this is my smart child, Liz, uh, Elizabeth rather. She, she and my dad always called me Elizabeth. Um, but as some time passed, I did begin to miss her, but missing missing more like the concept of a mother. Like there, mm. there are those sad songs about feeling like a motherless child. And I became very, what I now recognize is depression. I was depressed. I would, yeah. I would cry myself to sleep almost every, I don't, I can't figure out how often I would cry myself to sleep. But from the time she left through high school, I would, I would cry all the time, not during the day. We would keep our, keep our emotions very, I'd keep myself very together. And then by the end of the day, I would just be sobbing in my pillow, like burying my face in my pillow so that no one could hear me, like try to, I was trying not to scream like, or make any sound. So I would just make sort of these like, <sighs> like these hissing noises, like, <sighs> like trying to, not to be heard as I was like sobbing. And my dad was like, like I'd, I'd go through so many boxes of tissue on my nightstand. I had this little trash can and it'd be like full of tissue. Cause I'd be like blowing my nose and wiping my tears like every night. And, um, again, it's hard to like look back and see how, but this, this was like a regular thing. Um, and my dad was like, you're going through a lot of Kleenex and we just did, I was like, it's allergies, it's allergies. We just attributed it to allergies. Wow. <laughs> and, but I would go through so much tissue, like just cause I'd cry all the time. And, um, and do you think, and no one heard? I don't no think one so. Knew. Mm. I don't think so. And you know, we never talked about her. It just became like super taboo. Oh. I think, I think in the modern, in many modern families, it'd be like, let's, let's take the kids to like a child therapist and let's talk about this as a family and make sure that everyone's adjusting emotionally. But there was none of that. It's just like she disappeared. And then I just was trying to understand on my own and sort of just came to the conclusion, like that I was, that she, that I was ugly and that I was unlovable and if I had been less ugly and more lovable, perhaps she would have stayed. It's kind of where I landed. Because um, it's like my own mother didn't, ha- didn't love me enough to stay in my life. Um, that's just what I concluded. And so my self-esteem was very low. And I also, she wasn't there to feed us anymore. So there was a huge shift in our health and what we ate. My dad was working full time. So I was home alone a lot. My siblings and I were home alone a lot. Um, just latchkey kids, you know, cause he worked, we walked to school, we'd walk home, lock the doors. And so things were very quiet. Um, and I just could eat, like she was no longer there to like watch my diet or like make fresh food for me, like, or cut up fruit. And so I just started eating like huge bags of like family size or like those super sized bags of Doritos and like frozen burritos. And, um, we had a lot of, of, um, processed prepackaged dehydrated foods. And that's what we would make for ourselves after school. And my dad was really good about making dinner. Um, he'd, he'd try to make us red beans and rice once a week. He'd make pot roast, um, fried rice with spam. We kept that one and hamburger helper. We'd ate a lot of hamburger helper. 
uh, and anything that could be microwaved. Um, so even grilled cheese was made in the microwave. You'd start with the toaster and then you'd put the cheese on it and then put it in the microwave to melt the cheese. Like he, I, I can only imagine what it was like for him to suddenly be a single dad. Um, he, I look back now and I know he was doing his best, but I would complain so much about what we were eating. Like I, it took until high school or when, or as I got a little older and I started kind of taking things into my own hands and cooking. So my sister and I, we did more cooking, cleaning. We kind of took on the, the female work or what was traditionally yeah, female the traditional work. female work. Mm. Um, so I did learn to cook at a young age and I remember introducing the family to the onion in high school. Mm. I brought back the onion instead of onion powder or instead of the seasoning packet, mm. just the seasoning packet in the cardboard box of mm. hamburger helper or gratin potatoes or uh, rice aroni or stovetop stuffing or yeah. Like I, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, Oh, and then I have to mention my, there was one, there was one woman figure in my life from my family and that was my dad's mom, uh, my grandma. And she taught, she's the one who taught me how to make gumbo. And she, my dad made sure we had some time with her and she, she helped teach me how to cook too. So like Southern foods, like, um, greens, um, the gumbo, what else? Um, dirty rice, uh, etouffee, um, Yum. You're Rolls. making me, you're making me hungry. <laughs> um, it's good food. Yeah. Oh, this like really great dish with just like, um, noodles and shrimp and spinach. Um, you probably weren't able to learn your mom's cooking. I, I learned a little bit okay. actually. Okay. I would watch her cook. Um, so that, that's actually something that my siblings and I, that's the way we remembered her. And that's the way I still do remember her was through, through food. Cause after she left, we still did try to make as much Korean food as we could. And, and so we'd, we'd get the Korean ramen at the commissary. Um, I, I figured out how to make cha jangmyeon, that black bean paste sauce thing at some point. Um, and we, we did a lot of like the easy stuff, like spam and rice and, um, uh, those right, the rice cakes, the, the duck T T U K or D U K is how you would spell it. Um, cause we could, we could, we could make that easily and just add like gochujang or like s spices and so there, there were some things that we held on to and we, we would, that we kept part of our diet, mm. but yeah. But overall must've been devastating to lose your mom. It really was. It affected me and still affects me for sure. Um, it just became, I just became like a sad child <laughs> and I still am sad. Mm. Yeah. I just, that's just like kind of like changed the tone of my being. Your personality? Yeah. 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 It affected who I was for sure. And then at this similar, around the same, well, it was when I was 13 that I started keeping a journal. I started writing and I really think that my really getting into writing was a result of not having anyone to talk to, you know, like other kids would go home and I try to do this for my kids now, but you know, come home from school and be like, how was your day? Tell me about your day. What did you do today? And I would come home to like m my siblings and I didn't like really interact too much. We were pretty, I don't know. We were just quiet. So I would, but I would come home and I started writing in a journal and I would write for hours and hours. And it was the person that I talked to. Um, Cause I didn't have anyone to talk to. <laughs> um, there was, I, I, I have a memory though, before my mom left, she was, you know, 
and and so so religious and she she loved looking out our kitchen window at this beautiful like white chapel on the on the hillside and she just loved it she's like i can see this beautiful church and then she realized it was a mormon church mm. and then she was like ugh like she didn't like it anymore and she started put it she put like like potted plants in the window <laughs> you like couldn't see it as clearly and like, but I could still peer around and I saw the Mormon church on the hill. But at the time, like when I was younger, I didn't know the difference between Mormons and Muslims. Mm -hmm. Like they sound similar. So we, when we drive by the Mormon churches and it's say like church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I'm like, it just doesn't seem Muslim. It doesn't seem like it. Mm -hmm. right, it's just so confusing to me. Like, I, cause that, they're totally different cultures mm -hmm. <laughs> like totally like, that originated on the opposite sides of the world. And so I was like, so weird that it has this like kind of clean white look and mm. no like kind of Middle Eastern flair. <laughs> so it really wasn't until um, I made friends with Mormons. Mm. Do we want to get into that? Yeah. Should we jump into how you... Ended up investigating the church. Can I ask one church? final question about this time? I was just really curious. Um, you've described it a little bit, your uh, relationship with your siblings after your mom left. Mm -hmm. But during that time of change, how would you talk about, like, did you talk together? Uh, what, you're, what you've described so far is so much like internalizing, you're mm -hmm. processing kind of on your own alone, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um did you ever talk about it with your siblings and did you ever observe their processing if their processing was different? Like, did they also process similarly? I, I, I don't know. We, we didn't talk to each other. We didn't, we weren't the type of family to share emotions or share personal things. Like, you know, I would never go to my older sister and be like, I have a crush on so-and-so. Like, we didn't have that type of relationship. Um, things were really, like, it was just so taboo. We just didn't talk about our feelings. We were all very quiet, very, very quiet. Um, I remember, this is such a crazy moment, but I remember I started my, when I started my period, no one had told me about, that I didn't know what was happening. So mm. I thought I was dying. I thought I was dead. I, I thought I, like my life was ending. Yeah. Um, and so I like hobbled out to the backyard and was like, dad, I'm bleeding. And he's like, oh, um, go talk to your sister. <laughs> so I like hobbled upstairs and I'm like shaking. And, and she just like grabbed me like a pack of pads from her closet. And that was it. Like we, that's what like you that's got. It. That's what you got. That's it. So oh. that, that kind of describes like yeah. the level of communication in our home. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. Uh, or like, just, just like we couldn't talk about personal things. Like, like when, when I was 13 or 14, um, I remember like very shyly asking my dad if I could buy a razor so that I could shave my legs. And I was so embarrassed to approach him about that. Um, mm. or like, he took me to buy my first bra and it was super awkward because we go to the, the section of JC Penney or whatever. And the woman's like, so what size are you? And I'm like, I don't know. I've actually never worn a bra. She's like, really? And then she measured me and I was already like a full C. <laughs> mm -hmm. So she's like hooking me up with like a full grown woman's bra. And I was, had no, I, I just, yeah. I just wore like big baggy shirts and, yeah. and didn't, um, I didn't have anyone guiding me through that, uh, adolescent period. So that also led to me going into high school feeling like feeling really awkward and yeah. confused. There's about. this profound sense of aloneness. But yeah. Also just how do you learn to become a woman without a woman as a mentor? I, I... Oh, this is where... The young women's program. Mm. Is yes, like it my makes so much sense race. with mm. what you're describing. Right. All right. All right. Should we jump into <laughs> how, that, how that happened? Yeah. Okay. So, middle school, I started making friends with a couple of Mormon girls. 
really, really good friends. And, um, and then when I started high school, so I was 13 when I started high school. Again, everyone was like 14, 15, 16, 17, turning 18. So I was 13. And, um, I may, I, I had these Mormon girlfriends and all of our names started with L I won't say who they are, but all of us had names that started with L, Liz, and these other girls. And I would go to their houses, and the feeling in their homes was just like nothing I'd ever experienced. They all had little siblings or or larger families. So between like five and eight or nine kids in these Mormon homes. And I'd go there and was like, this is, what is this? Like, this is a, so different from what I was living at home. Um, I mean, and I don't know if I want to get into it too much, but my, my dad was kind of violent. And so I also, I, I didn't feel safe at home, but I'd go to the, my friend's houses and it was just like this lovely feeling, just like this, this light, wonderful feeling when I was in their homes. And I, and, and I'd never been around little kids before cause I, I, I was the youngest in my family. Yeah. So I'd never been around toddlers or kids like younger and I was so fascinated and intrigued and charmed by their innocence and antics and their giggles and just like the funny things that they did. And I, I was like enamored by these toddlers, like these little kids, like they were so like pure and like happy. They were just like purely happy kids. And which is not what I experienced as a kid. So I'm like looking at it's like it was like it was like observing aliens or something. Like these are completely different creatures. <laughs> um so I I was was I a freshman? Yeah, I must have been a freshman. I was 13. And my friends invited me to their church dance. This was my introduction, my true introduction to the Mormon church world. Church dance. The church dance. I, this was, this was a little tricky. They kind of had to sneak me in because you're not allowed to go to dances unless you're 14. But again, I was younger than everybody, so I was 13. So they're like, we won't tell anybody. And I know that that like was like a really difficult moral decision for them. But they're like, we'll just leave it up to you. And, and so I went, I went to a, a dance and it was the first time I went into a Mormon church and I loved it. I loved everything about it. And I, you know, this is when boys are becoming a thing. And like the first time a boy like held my hand and we did a little slow dance, of course, with enough room to keep a quad between your body. A quad. Yeah. Not the, just a Book of Mormon. No, entire no, quad. you got the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, the New Testament and Old Testament in a stack that has to be between your bodies. Um, <laughs> and it was just magical. I'd never experienced anything like the joy and just like ecstasy that I felt when I was in that environment. And so I just like, I wanted to go to every dance that I could with them. It was so fun. It was so different and just like a place where I could go and be just like purely happy and mm. be with my friends and dance and like meet boys. And, um, and like, it's when I, uh, it's like, I think, I guess it's maybe a time when I started wanting to look pretty too. Um, and then at the same time, I was in pit orchestra at the school musical. It was the, it was the, <laughs> the musical was the nifty fifties and I was playing uh, clarinet in the pit and also actually no on this one, I was playing bass guitar and in the pit, there was the most beautiful Mormon boy playing the saxophone and I 
he was two, he was a junior when I was a freshman and I noticed him reading during like little breaks as we were sitting down there in the pit. He was reading some really thick book, which I believe was a quad or what I would learn is a quad. And I went over to him and I was, we were just sitting and chatting and, and he, he became like friends with me. And he was like the, probably the first boy that like actually just like talked to me casually and would ask how I was doing. That was, that was an unusual thing for, for someone to ask me like, Hey, how are you? And like really mean it. Um, that it, it like made me feel so special <laughs> that he'd be like, Hey, like, how's it going? Like, how are you? And I was like, someone cares and not just anyone, but like this really cute boy. <laughs> and so I, I asked him during pit orchestra because we, we became like close during his time. He, he was teaching me like how to solve a Rubik's cube while we were down there. And I asked him what he was reading and he was said he was studying for seminary. I was like, what is seminary? He's like, uh, well, um, it's, it's where I study my religion and this is a book of Mormon. This is, I'm reading from the book of Mormon. And I was like, what is that? I'd never heard of the book of Mormon ever. And he kind of just like loosely described to me, was, uh, there were gold plates translated by a guy named Joseph Smith. And I joked and was like, Oh, like, like Joe Smith, or I would have heard him as Joe Smith and I, he would get like kind of clammy. And I guess I learned later that that's what like the mobs would call the enemies would call Joseph Smith, Joe Smith. Where are your plates, Joe? <laughs> yeah, right. Joe. But I just was like trying to be like cute, like, Oh, Joe Smith. <laughs> and, um, so he kind of, we, we started writing notes to each other. And he would write notes and I'd be like, what, tell me more about this. And he'd write back and be like, like, it's a story about the Nephites and the Lamanites and where they came, like they came from Jerusalem or whatever and came to the Americas and, and the Native Americans, like the Lamanites became what we now know as the Native Americans and just started introducing me to this. And, um, I was so intrigued. It was so weird. And like, I have always been, you know, as I described, like from a kid, I've always been a little different and like, I am kind of a weird person. <laughs> and like, so Mormonism from the start, like intrigued me because it was different and I was different and it was different and it was weird. And it was like a little bit creepy, but I kind of liked that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then when I, so he, he gave me this friend. I, w I wonder if I should give him a name because he becomes a very central figure in this story. What should I call him? Can I give people fake names? Okay, let's call him. Um, <sighs> Maybe first letter, different name. Yeah, let's call him Stan. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that, that works for me because your description of Mormon families matches the way Mormon families are depicted in South Park and Stan. Oh, is there a Stan a in South Park? I don't even know. I didn't know that. Oh, great. So okay. Stan so we've works. got Stan. Stan <laughs> gives me a, a, a copy of the Book of Mormon with his testimony written inside. And him giving that to me felt like he was giving me like the ultimate love note. We would pass <laughs> notes to each other. And I was like, he is giving me his heart. Like what's at the center of his heart? What's most important to him? He's giving me the Book of Mormon. And um, my other Mormon friends, they all wrote their testimonies in it too. It kind of got passed around. Um, but, you know, prior to him giving it to me, again, I come back to Joseph Smith as this character that I related with so strongly because he was 14, 13, 14. I was 13. And I, and I, when I was reading the book Mormon, I, I turned 14, but, um, I like him was like, which of these dang churches is true. My friends of all these different religions, I've been to, you know, three churches so far, the Catholic church, my mom's Korean church and this Baptist church where I, my dad would still take us and we'd sit in the back and not be involved. But I was like really getting, starting to get curious about religion, um, 
And when you're that age, that's also when some of the kids begin to develop like sort of a fanaticism because it's, it's such an important part of their identity. And it's like they, it's like they were gravitating towards that as like what defined them as people. And so I was like, what is truth? And so I started reading the new Testament just on my own. Like, I want to know, I want to know what this is all about. Um, and although I had read scriptures with my mom as a kid, like, you know, those little cartoony pic I had a, do you remember Precious Moments? Mm -hmm. That Those little cartoons with like the teardrop eyes, super cute Precious Moments. I had a Precious Moments Illustrated Bible. I think the NIV version was that New International. Um, and then I also had another Illustrated Bible that had the scariest, creepiest picture of Jonah and the whale that made me afraid of fish and water for the rest of my life. I still am. But it, like this dark picture with like, like Jonah, like sinking into the dark sea and then like coming out of the darkness. Like it's not fully visible, but you see like the front of the whale coming out of the darkness, giant whale coming to eat him. <laughs> like that's, that's how I understand the ocean from that. Anyway, that was a side note. But, you know, so I had Here. exposure to like scriptures and some of these scriptural stories as a kid, but like, you know, I was becoming a young woman and I was beginning to think for myself and I wanted to know what was really true. And so I started reading scriptures on my own. And then I got this book of Mormon the day I got it. Um, you know, I remember I was standing at my locker when he handed it to me and he, um, I was like, you know, thank you. And, um, I took it with me to my health class and it was on my desk and this is the health class. Maybe it was even that day we were watching the slideshow of STDs, <laughs> you know, like, uh, just like the contrast between like this, like fresh book of scriptures and like the things that we were talking about in health class. But, um, next to me was also another Mormon boy and, and he's like, what are you going to do with it? And he was like, are you going to read it? And I was holding it and thinking about it and just probably during the passing period before that I'd shown one of my girlfriends who was a very devout Christian and she said like to burn it and don't read it and like it's evil <laughs> and I so then I so I had that perspective and then I go to cl class and sit next to a Mormon who's like he, he was really actually he wasn't pushy at all. He was just like curious as to what I would do. And I said, I think I'm going to read it. And um, so I did. I started reading it. I started devouring it. I read it like, you know, I Mormons, I have these like, oh, there's so much in the culture, you know, but there's, there's like that thing where the family will read a chapter a day, mm -hmm. but I just was reading it like a novel, like a, like a, fiction book or, mm. but, but I, I, I wasn't reading it as fiction. I just assumed that it was absolutely completely history. True. Yes. History. So I started reading it and then, you know, I would still write notes back and forth with this, with Stan asking questions, asking more questions. And, um, and it was sort of a way for me to get closer to this person that I was like head over heels for, you know, just falling in love with this blue eyed, nice white Mormon boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he, so the, it was like a way that I could get closer to him and have something to talk about with him too. But I just devoured it and, and would talk with my best girlfriend. Um, I would turn to her and she, she's the, the Mormon friend where I went to her house the most often and, and got exposed to like this whole new culture. Like her mom would do canning, like get produce from the Bishop storehouse and can fresh salsa and can tomatoes. And I watched that and I learned how to make salsa myself and, um, just started connecting with, like I said, you know, I'd go to their homes and I was like, this is like a different, this is like an alien planet and I like it. And so I started sort of trying to, not even trying to, but I was just naturally so curious and in love with everything related to Mormonism. Like just all the things that made it what it was, made it so unique, like canning. 
That's so cool. Like the, the sort of um, traditional food preparation <laughs> or like homemade bread. The Mormons would make homemade bread. <laughs> That's not it. it um, and they, they just, they all seem to have this consistent way of living with their family scripture study. And then this was a terrible, what I now see as a terrible thing. But this boy gave me the little for strength of youth pocket version pamphlet because I was starting to ask questions about like the social, the social life. There were like these age restrictions, like, you know, you could, you can go to a dance unless you're 14. And then I learned that the Mormons wouldn't date until they were 16. And I was like, dang it. Like, cause I'm young. again, I was younger than everybody by a year. So my, my Mormon friends would be able to start dating before I was because I started to adopt the way of life and prescribe it to myself. Um, and as I was saying earlier, like I had this perfectionist attitude and um, there were, there were kind of two groups of Mormons, I would say at school, there were the obedient Mormons and the disobedient Mormons, almost like a class system. And I, and the obedient Mormons were also the ones who like me were in the honors classes and eventually the AP classes. And they were like these, they were very intelligent, like, um, and then, you know, the, the, the obedient Mormons would look down on the, the non-obedient Mormons. And so, but I was like, I'm with the obedient Mormons. <laughs> and, <Wow. laughs> and, um, you know, I, 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 I got to that point in the book of Mormon where it's, where I was instructed to pray. There's that verse. I don't remember exactly what Mormon it is. 10, four, where you're encouraged to pray to know if the book of yeah. Mormon is true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I that my friends introduced that verse to me. Actually, Stan went through the book of my Book of Mormon, and he highlighted all this, all the Scripture mastery verses, the the special, the highlights, the highlights of the Book of Mormon. So uh, I was aware of this verse, and uh, my friends, my girlfriends, and and Stan, and um, this other guy um, from health class. Um, We'll call him AJ. AJ was best friends with Stan. Um, they had all written their, their testimonies in the book and, and had and had written in that challenge, like and 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 then pray to know if it's true. And so I did that. But by the time I got to that verse, because it's towards the end, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very end. By the time I got to that, I was already like, this is this is true. Like. It, it, all the f good feelings that I had when I was with my Mormon friends, I sort of like, it's like all that would come into my body and my mind as I was reading the Book of Mormon. Because it's something that I could have at home with me. When I wasn't in their homes, when I wasn't with them, when I wasn't at the church building for a dance, I could have the Book of Mormon with me in my home with me. And I could read it and I could connect with that whole world. So the Book of Mormon, it was so special to me. It was, it was, I mean, it was unusual. It was weird, but I just ate it up. Like I, again, I was reading it like a novel and just would get up and read pages and pages and pages or like an entire book. And I got through it pretty quickly and was like, this is true. And I want to join this church and I want to be baptized and I want to be Mormon. But What's interesting is I got to the very, it was literally the last page of the Book of Mormon. I had been reading this in secret. I didn't want my siblings to see it. I didn't want my dad to see it. I would, um, in my room, there was this cool little space. Like I had a, a, a two-door closet with a sliding door, and there was a gap between the top of the closet and the ceiling of the room. And my dad was super cool and he built a ladder and it was like a little loft and he put like a little um, edge on it so that it wouldn't roll off. And I had a blanket up there and I'd keep like some special stuffed animals and trinkets. And so I would often go up to my loft and read the Book of Mormon up there where no one could, where no one could find me. And, but I was, I was I, I misstepped 
when I, w- I was on the very last page. And I think one of my siblings was listening to really loud music or something. And I was like, this is it. This is the, the last page. I, I have to enjoy it. I was savoring it. And so I like plugged my ears and was reading the last page when my, I didn't notice my dad came down the hall and he walked in the room and he saw what I was, he said, what, what is that? And he grabbed it from me and he immediately threw it on the floor and began just screaming at me. And I had no idea what, why this reaction was happening. I, I didn't understand, but he was just saying things like, you're not allowed to have this in our home. There's, this is unacceptable. And I was devastated and he took it away. And, um, but little did he know, Stan had also given me a copy of the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Cri- Pearl of Great Price that also had the Book of Mormon in it. So after my dad took that Book of Mormon away, I was able to pull the other one out of my drawer and finish it finished reading it. I read the whole thing. And um, that began a new era of conflict with my father because it became this, this fight, this fight. I'd be crying and sobbing and pleading, like, just let me be baptized. Let me join the church. I just want to go. I just want to go to church with my friends. Um, I mean, when I'd go to a church dance, I loved being there so much. It, I mean, it was, it was all the things that I, that I needed at the time as a, as a kind of a lonely girl. Like it was, and, and again, I, I don't want to get too much into like what I experienced in terms of violence in my home, but it was a safe place. It was a safe place. And so when I was at the church, after the dances were over, I would sit on one of those floral couches in one of those little foyer areas, and I just would stay as long as I possibly could. I would sort of like, like, um, you know, kind of linger or uh, try to put off catching that ride home as long as I could. I just wanted to stay. I just wanted to be there, like be in that place. It was, it was so, uh, it was just like, this place of peace and comfort. It felt like a sanctuary. It was my sanctuary. It was like the first time I'd, um, you know, if I were to define the word sanctuary at that time, that was it. That was my safe place. So, um, you know, I'm begging my dad, let me go. And he's like saying that I can't have a Book of Mormon in the house or so then my friends were giving me like, well, if you can't have a Book of Mormon, we'll give you the church magazines. So then I would read those. And then I was like, well, if I can't read the Book of Mormon, I will read everything else. So I read the entire Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. And I read the entire Bible from cover to cover, mm-hmm. New Testament, Old Testament, all of it. To keep me entertained through the Old Testament, I would look for n- names for my future children. <laughs> I'd like try to find unusual names. I really liked the name Reuben. That's one I remember stood, stood out to me, but, um, and then it gave me something to talk about with my Mormon friends. We'd talk about doctrines. We talked about, we talked about, um, uh, kind of m- the Mormon interpretation of old New Testament, old Testament. Um, and then I, you know, I secretly, I had the, the book of Mormon, um, well, yeah, I had that doctrine and covenants and book of Mormon combo. So I still had a book of Mormon. I just, it was just a secret. Um, and then I, my dad would let me go to dances occasionally. And then at some point, I think during my sophomore year, he let me go to church. I got to go to like a sacrament meeting and I just loved it. I just loved it. And, um, but he'd only let me go occasionally. And I, I believe it was my junior year when I made it. We made a deal. We made a compromise that I could go once every five weeks. <laughs> I could go to church, the Mormon church, once it's every very particular. five weeks. <laughs> but then when I was a senior and my oldest siblings had gone to college, I was the last one left. Um, I was able to go more often. I just had to ask week to week and he would let me go because, you know, years were passing and I wasn't letting up. I was like regularly 
mm-hmm. coming to him in tears saying like, please just let me be baptized. Like, please. And, um, and at this point were most of your friends Mormon at this uh, point or at school were you still, um, where you, was your friend group diverse? Uh, it was diverse definitely. Okay. But like, you know, my, my close, like I just had, it, I mean, a huge part of it was just the fact that I was so in love with Stan, you know, like it's a driver. Yeah. I wanted Across to go, multiple years. Oh yeah. Oh, I follow, I, in the future, I follow him to BYU. Oh, yeah, this is okay. part of it because I was like, um, well, well, here's here are a couple of things. I going back to the fact that he gave me the first strength of youth pamphlet. That was because I, I think I was asking like about these rules, like because I'd hear like, oh, like you you can't wear sleeveless things. Oh, well, okay, let me change that about myself. Um, what else, what else Mm. is in there? And so I finally got like the pamphlet itself and again, devoured it because anything related to Mormonism, I was, I I mean, I was a fanatic. I was like my mom. And I think that's part of what freaked my dad out Mm. because apparently at some point my mom had called and was like, I am staying in Korea to do missionary work. That was like one of her big motivations. Um, I didn't learn that till later, but you know, so, so religion took my mother or was a factor. I think there were other things too in their relationship. My dad is a very difficult person to live with and I was now living with that, but, uh, she, you know, religion took her away. You could blame it on that. That was one of the factors took her away from the family. So then my dad saw me getting completely absorbed in this religion and it was like, pulling me away it was making me different than the family it was separating us it was it turned him into my enemy because i saw him as the person keeping me away from church and it's it's so funny because you know when people teenage girls are known for being like uh difficult i guess i don't know there's there's a another stereotype um um or rebellious. And in my rebellious teenage years, my rebellious thing was to go to church. Like, I don't care what you say. I want to go to the, I want to be with the Mormons. (laughs) Like that was my, that was my teenage rebellion (laughs) (laughs) to like be Mormon or like, or like try. But, uh, so given the first strength of youth pamphlet, I did a major overhaul of my life. I stopped watching rated R movies. I changed the way that I dressed. I started paying tithing. I wasn't even a member and I started paying tithing. That is unbelievable. And then I, I heard about the young women's, uh, the, the young women's in excellence thing that award. Yeah. Yeah. And like as a high achiever, I was like, I'm going to earn that. I'm going to get that necklace. And so I, I got that little booklet thing and the little associated little journal. And I, I did all of that. And, um, I would go to young women's activities occasionally. And, oh, that's where, that's where I found some new moms. Mm. That was magic. These wonderful women who were so nice to me. They were so nice. They were so nice. Uh, No one had ever treated me the way that these young women leaders did in terms of like, I care about you, Liz. Mm. And they would tell me things like, you are a daughter of God and you are beautiful. And you have, um, what was one of there? There's all those like this, the young women values. Mm -hmm like divine nature, is that one of them? Mm -hmm. They'd be like, you have divine nature. And I was like, really? Like, really? Because I thought I was this ugly girl that wasn't loved or lovable enough for even my own mother to care for me. And then there were these ladies like telling me like that I had a beautiful smile or, or like, congratulating me for my little accomplishments or recognizing my artistic and music skills. And they were just like, so wonderful. (laughs) I mean, everything about it was, was great, but, um, or I thought, (laughs) 
So, so I, I just want to highlight that tension that's emerging for me because there's, there really is two ways to see a Mormon conversion. One is that the church is just really there for people who need it, yeah. who need meaning, who need purpose, who need identity, who need morals or standards, who need family, community. Um, community. Yeah. And, and what a, what a blessing it probably it was. was to your life at the time. Yeah. Right? It's like everything, the nurturing that I needed from the mom who wasn't there, I was finding at church or with this new religion. I wasn't always at church, but I, and, and it was, it was clear that connection. And like, I, I was, I, I remember experiencing, you know, testimony meeting for the first time, going to church on a fast and testimony day and learning about fasting. And I began to fast. It was so inconvenient because I tried to do it secretly. And I thought that like God was providing me a way to be Mormon, even though I wasn't baptized. Cause it's like every fast Sunday, even if my dad was cooking something or somebody offered me breakfast, I was able to like sneakily avoid food without anybody noticing and I'd always be able to get through 24 hours without eating because God was providing me a way to fast um, without my family finding out. Mm. <laughs> just, oh, just like strange things. But um, I would go to fast and testimony meetings, um, you know, probably junior, senior year. And I would go to the pulpit and I would just pour out my soul about all the, all the things, how much I loved this true, the one and only true church and how grateful I was to have found the true church and how much I, how much I loved and identified with Joseph Smith and how beautiful the Book of Mormon was. And then I would all uh, often like mention my mom, just, I don't, you know, I just mentioned like how sad I was after my mom left and then how wonderful it was to find this and how it brought me happiness that I'd never, that I'd never experienced before, like a level of peace that I'd never felt, like like there was light in my life that I needed so desperately. It was, I mean, yeah. I think I, I don't know if I needed it, I wanted it, but I I was fed. I was nurtured, you know, by this group of people. Yeah, I often say that for many people, religious conversion is a social conversion. We were taught that it's an intellectual or an emotional, spiritual kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But man, just if you're seeing these families that are so seem so perfect, yeah, you're seeing these kids that seem so happy. Yes, you're feeling all these voids in your life, whether it's maternal voids or mm -hmm. social voids, friendship voids, moral voids, direction, purpose, meaning mm -hmm. what else is going to, what else is going to present itself to a high school girl who's in effect been half orphaned? Yeah. What else is going to present itself to her to say, Hey, here's a path other than a religion. What else is there? Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and who does that? Question. Who does that better than the Mormon Church yeah, these days? Just take you into the fold and nurture you, and and uh, they want you. They wanted me. That, yes. that that missionary spirit. My friends were so so excited to be able to say our friend got a Book of Mormon and has converted. I, we converted somebody. That's they right. They could take credit for that. Stan, he got the ultimate credit because it's like I gave. I'm the one. I'm the one who gave her that Book of Mormon. Like, yeah. he was the winner. <laughs> and did you ever get the date stand in oh, high school? Um, in high school. Well, here's the thing. So I was, he was a junior when I was a freshman. Oh, okay. So I was, again, 13 when I was a freshman and 14 turning 15 when I was a sophomore. So he wouldn't, he wouldn't date. Mm -hmm. anyone unless they were 16. Yeah. So, and also early on, he said Mormons, he wouldn't say 
they didn't say exactly. Well, no, they kind of did. They were like, Mormons just state Mormons. And I was like, why? That, that doesn't, what? <laughs> and, but they, the way they explained it is like, we were encouraged. And I think it was in the first rank of the youth to like date, date someone, date people with high standards. <laughs> is that the way they phrase it? <laughs> And high standards meant Mormon. Mm -hmm. It's like the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I, this was the obedient Mormon crowd. We followed all the rules. Yeah. Um, so he wouldn't take me on a date. And, um, but my junior year, he was at BYU. And I was already like, I'm going to go to BYU. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was really like, He's, he was the one who was like the oldest of nine kids and that was the biggest family. And I saw, so he had younger, his younger brother was in my grade. His younger sister was a grade below me. There were so many of them, you know, so many of those kids from that family <laughs> everywhere. And, um, but his mom, this, this was a life changing moment for me. His mom was pregnant with the ninth kid and I got to observe that because again I'd never been around little kids children and this was the first time someone like in my kind of that uh, someone that I interacted with regularly was pregnant with child and then it was the night of one of our band concerts that she had the baby and I got to go to their house and see the newborn and I'd never seen a newborn before and it was like it's it's amazing. It's amazing. No one can de deny that like to 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 see a a new life. I was I was so floored and magical again like magical aliens like I mean that baby could have been like Jesus. <laughs> I was that enamored. Like, come on, shepherds, where are the, where are the three kings? Like, like, let's make this an event. We are seeing, we have observed, like, the, a child has been born. <laughs> I was so enthusiastic. And um, that's when I was like, I'm going to be a mom. I want, I want to do this too. I want to be a mom. But, you know, as I was obsessed with Mormon culture, it wasn't like I was just going to be a mom. I was like, I'm going to have like eight kids, eight or nine kids. And I just envisioned like, I'm going to marry Stan and I'm going to be the next generation. I'm going to be the next, the next, um, you know, matriarch of the next generation of this family, this particular family. So that I like, I, I just had that in my mind. I had like this goal. I was like, I'm going to go to BYU. Um, when I'm a junior and a senior, uh, or, okay, no, no, no. When I was a senior, okay, no, no, no. When I was a junior, Stan was a freshman at BYU. When I was a senior, he had left on his mission. I do end up going to BYU. I'll continue that. But, um, but I was like, I'm going to marry Stan and have a big Mormon family. And this was so, it was nothing I'd ever like thought of before I never, I never wanted to be a mom. It wasn't, it was just not something I ever thought about. I never, I honestly thought, especially when I was younger and like overweight from eating so many Doritos and frozen burritos. Um, I was like, no one would ever marry me. That's not even like, I shouldn't even entertain the thought like who would ever marry me. Mm. Um, but then I like, you know, after going to these Mormon dances and actually having boys like ask me to dance cause they thought I was cute. I was like, wait a minute, like maybe, maybe I could find companionship. <laughs> maybe I'm actually mm. worthy of that. Mm. Maybe I could have that too. And, but at the same time, like I, again, like I was academically like an all-star, like, and I was also a really good musician. I was first chair on clarinet at school and first chair in the city youth symphony on bass, Colorado Springs youth symphony. And I got first chair at all state orchestra and Western States orchestra. I was, I was killing it musically and I was killing it academically and all the AP classes. And again, I was younger than everyone and everyone like that was just like, 
my expectation for myself too. And, and what appealed to me with the Mormon crowd too, cause they were, they're sort of elitist. <laughs> and I was like all about that. Like you guys are, per you think you're perfect. Let me be as perfect as you and even more perfect. Mm -hmm. Like I was just all about that. It was like a game. Like, um, I like challenge accepted, you know, um, no rated R movies challenge accepted. <laughs> like I, uh, I remember my family went to go see gladiator on a Sunday and they, and I was like forced to go with them. And I was like, you are making me sin. <laughs> what are you for? Like, like just feeling like such a victim, mm. <laughs> like making me watch a rated R movie on a Sunday. I mean, from your dad's the perspective, there are worse ways a kid can rebel, <laughs> right? I wonder if your dad realized at some level that there are a lot of worse ways a kid can rebel than to be a Mormon, right? I think that's what, I think that's why he kind of loosened up towards, you know, my junior or my senior year, especially once my siblings were gone. Cause it's like, oh, Liz, she's, she's, it's too far gone. She's too <laughs> far gone. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so he began to, to accept it, um, but still, I couldn't be baptized. That was a thing. And um, so that, that I, speaking of just like not having a firm sense of identity, that also messed with me because it's like, okay, I can't say I'm black, I'm totally black. I can't say I'm Korean or totally Korean. I, I can say I'm both. And then I can't say that I'm Mormon because I'm not like totally Mormon. I'm not baptized. Like it wasn't a, I wasn't yeah. a member of the club. Um, the kids would, there were things that they were able to do that I wasn't able to participate in. Yeah. That was a yeah. big one. That was a big thing. And, um, but also like they would have like interviews with their bishop. Or patriarchal blessings. A patriarchal blessing. I wanted that. Did you try to do, do the seminary at all? Did you try and no, go? No, I never went to seminary. Okay. That was not. That would have made it worse. <laughs> it would only accentuated the things you weren't able to do. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I felt so the way that I described it and I, and I put this in the letter that you read, but you know, I went to a testimony meeting once and I was like, I just saying to the congregation, like, I just want to be one of you. I just, I want to be one of you. I want to be able to call myself a Mormon. I want to be baptized so badly. And I described it like, like there was a glass floor or glass ceiling. The glass was their floor and it was my ceiling. So I was looking up through the glass, walking, watching all of them walking together, kind of holding the iron rod, moving together on the covenant path. Um, and they were legitimate members of the club that I wanted to join. But I was, <laughs> I mean, maybe you could compare it to like the I mean, the, the black girl looking at the white people, but in the time of segregation where we're not allowed to share water fountains and I just want to drink from their freaking water fountain. Mm. That's what I want. You're outside looking in. Yeah. Mm. Like, can I just be one of you, please? Can I drink from that same fountain? Um, mm. And so I describe that to them. Like, I feel like I'm on the other side of the glass but, but here's the thing. I'm walking the same walk. I'm doing all the things I have. I got my young woman's medallion. I pay my tithing. I read my scriptures every day. I fast. I, I am doing everything that I possibly can walking with you, but I'm on, I'm upside down and I'm on the other side of the glass. I'm following your footsteps, but I'm still on the other side. Like, is what do what I have new, to do? Is this what the new era article is about? Being, Actually, a dry, being a dry Mormon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that article was about my experience when I turned 16 on my 16th birthday, I was a junior, end of my junior year. Um, and by that point, I think I had talked my dad into allowing me to invite the missionaries over for dinner. I even made them the family recipe gumbo. Um, mm. they, and I got out the fine China, my mom's China, which I now have actually, um, her beautiful, like gold golden edges roses it's um mm. it's the same china that 
was in a uh, princess diaries movie mm. and it was in my best friend's wedding. Mm. Like oh. it's a very iconic, like China pattern. That's pretty common. Um, uh, I think it's called country rose. Anyway, I got out the fine China for the missionaries. And so they would stop by every now and again, just to check on me. Um, so they came by one day and it happened to be on my birthday, my 16th birthday. And I was like, Hey guys, it's my birthday. And they were like, are you 18? Like, can you be baptized? Is this it? And I was like, no, I'm only 16. I still can't be baptized. And I was just lamenting with them. And I was like, I just wish I could say that I was Mormon. I wish I could say that I was a Latter-day Saint because I'm doing everything. I'm, I'm, I'm walking the walk better than the Mormons are even walking the walk. Like, what do I have to do to like prove to people that I'm Mormon or be able to just say it, just say it. And so the mission, one of the missionaries, he said like, you know what? And, and we felt the spirit, we felt the spirit. It was tangible in the room. He's like, if you believe the book of Mormon to be true and you believe that this is the true church, you are a Latter day Saint. <laughs> And I was like, I bestow upon the <laughs> Mormon. Yeah. I was like, really? Like, I'm... And so that was a turning point. So that was the end of my junior year. So my senior year, I started telling people occasionally close, trusted people. Mm. I would identify as Mormon to them, but that got me in trouble. Like there was a boy that I asked to Sadie Hawkins, who was not Mormon so cute. He had, he had curly hair, kind of like me. Um, but at the time my hair was straightened cause I always had straight, I always straightened my hair. I was going to ask you about that. If that oh, was something that's that part of the journey, if that was something that continued through high yeah. school. Oh yeah. I mean, it's this kind of sidetracking a little bit, but my dad, after my mom left, my dad didn't know how to do my hair. And so he started taking me to black hairdressers to relax my hair. And I never like, I never considered it an option. Like, it's just like he would notice that my roots were growing out and make an appointment for me. And I think he saw that as a way also for me to be exposed to, to my black heritage. I didn't see it at, that way at the time, like looking, I, I have mixed feelings about it. Cause part of me is like, they were trying to make me look more white and fit in by straightening my hair. But at the, at the same time though, like my experience going to black salons and having black women do my hair was the only time that I interacted with black people outside my family. Mm. Mm. That was, that was the only time I ever saw. Cause your high school people. was predominantly white. Yeah. There were like a couple of black kids, but I wasn't like friends with them. Mm. Um, there were maybe like, you know, in my, in my grade, I can think of one other black girl in the entire grade wow. and okay. one and two black, no, one black kid, one black boy. Mm. Um, there was another black kid in the like, year younger than me. So very few, we were very, uh, there weren't very many of us. Um, I did though connect with some other half Asians because it was a military, because of the military bases. And I mean, it's just a thing. It's just a thing that GIs would go and marry women from other places in the world and bring mm -hmm. them back. So there were actually like other half Korean girls at school who had the same stories. Their dad was in the army and married a Korean woman. And so we, I did like super vibe with those people. Like we had a connection that was really cool. One of my actually neighbors just three doors down, she was half Korean and we were so proud of our Korean heritage and her mom later in life, um, they, they were, they were there when my mom left and I would go to their house and like smell the Korean food. And her mom later in life was like, just expressing her regret that she didn't cook for us. Like not recognizing that, like how much I missed it. Mm. And like, she had an opportunity to like bring us food sometimes like yeah. real Korean food and she didn't and she regrets it. Um, yeah. Where were okay, we, you were at Sadie Hawkins. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And sorry, you brought you brought up that your yes. date had curly hair. Uh, so back. so I I asked this boy to Sadie Hawkins, and he was he was Catholic from a huge family. He was the he was he was like Stan, but Stan was gone. Stan was gone on his. So mission. what are you to do? 
<laughs> so I found someone who was kind of like him. Um, he was the oldest of, I think, eight kids, kind of the big brother, which is very charming. You know, guys who are good with kids. Yes. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so he was like that, just like this quiet, like very sweet boy with a bunch of little siblings and um, just uh, from this Catholic family, though. And um, we went to Sadie Hawkins together and everyone dressed as like um, couple or, or like you'd, you'd dress up sort of as like a, a pair of something. So I made us shirts where um, either I was the cheese or he was the cracker or I was the cracker and he was the cheese. And now that I think about it, it's kind of being a crackers not a mm. great thing. Anyway, mm-hmm. but we were cheese and crackers. And I and I did uh we did a Mormon style progressive dinner mm. with the Mormon friends. Also something I'd never heard of before, the progressive dinner, but it's something that they would do for dates. It was like this cultural thing that I thought was kind of cool. So we teamed up with some of the Mormons and and we had dinner at my house and I and I think we had bulgogi. I think I made bulgogi mm. and I and I wore a traditional Korean dress. Oh wow! For dinner, um, which I took off and put my cheese shirt on to go to the dance. But um, so he was the cracker. <laughs> I think <laughs> I don't know. I'm I was not hoping sure. you were the cracker. I know. Maybe I was. It was a Ritz cracker too. It was it's a Ritz. Fine. It's fine. <laughs> anyway, we went to the dance and had this lovely time. And then he came back to my house and we watched a movie, and like there was this moment where we were playing with each other's hair and I was touching his curly hair and I thought like, maybe this will be my first kiss. And then my dad comes like bounding down the stairs, like, okay. And he turns the lights on and nice to have you over. Mm. And, um, but like, so, so there was sort of this, like, um, this little like flirtation going on. And, but, but I also felt kind of guilty because he wasn't Mormon. And I was like, I'm supposed to date Mormons. Even <laughs> this is a weird thing, right? Um, Even though you weren't baptized yet. But I, yeah. And so he's one of those first few people that I said, that I told him that I was Mormon. And then he like believed me. But then one of the Mormon girls at school, I think he invited him to church or something. And she's like, well, Liz comes to church and she's not Mormon. And so then he w- he came back to me and was like, you lied to me. You're like, you're a fraud. Like what? He, he was so confused and just his opinion of me suddenly changed because he's like, you're saying you're Mormon, but our other friend is saying that you go to church, but you're not Mormon. And I was like, no, I believe it. I like, like you if you just knew, and I gave him a copy of the Book of Mormon. And then, you said I was. <laughs> yeah, and, and like I just was trying to, and so I gave him a Book of Mormon, and then he like wouldn't talk to me anymore. It was so sad. Hmm. Um, I do want to rewind to the previous years uh, when I was 15, before I was allowed to date according to these standards that I prescribed to myself. A boy asked me to homecoming, and I was 15, and I didn't know what to do. I was like, what do I do? Like, he was just such a nice kid. And so I ended up saying yes, but I felt terribly guilty to be going on a date when I was 15 to homecoming. And um, it, it turned out fine. I, like, I, I didn't really like him. But then that, that year, junior year, there was also a Sadie Hawkins when I asked another non-Mormon, beautiful blonde kid, to Sadie Hawkins. And at that dance, it it may have been those two dances, that homecoming and that Sadie Hawkins were the first school dances that I went to. I only went to the church dances and at the, and my Mormon friends would tell me like how bad the school dances were. People could not fit a, you could not fit a quad between the kids dancing at the school dance. Um, it was a different, different energy, different music. And, um, but I went to the Sadie Hawkins, um, my junior year and it was the first time I danced really close to somebody and like the feelings that were coming over my body 
mm. was like, I didn't know what was happening to me. <laughs> it was the first time I felt like this feeling and I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> and, um, and he like slid his hand in my jean pockets and I was like about to like faint. <laughs> like I was like, but I felt so guilty because I knew we were breaking the rules and we were dancing too close. And um, mm. I went home that night and I started like writing in my journal and I was like, I have done something terrible. I will never feel these lustful feelings again. And I put it in my mind that I was going to write a book about bearing with, and each chapter would be my testimony of, of each um, section of the first strength of youth packet. I like came up with this idea after I went to this dance. Um, like I'm better than this. I'm not going to allow myself to feel those feelings again. I will repent and as part of my repentance process, I will write an entire book bearing my testimony of these principles. <laughs> and I wrote the first chapter of it that night, I think, about my testimony of the law of chastity. It's all so extreme, isn't it? It's like, I don't even know. I don't know. I think I remember reading in an outline you wrote at one point, feeling a lot of guilt and shame over masturbation. Yeah, let's and, talk about that. And I'm I'm wondering if that happened in high school or at, at BYU or like later there. or both. Um, yeah. both. Or, or if this is even the right time to bring it up. No, yeah, no. Okay. I mean, when that... Did I get that right? Did I yeah. remember that right? Okay. Yeah, when, when I read that in the pamphlet, I did everything I could to like try to, to not do that anymore. But I would fail and slip up and would feel horrible. Mm. Um every horrible and and it that at BYU was I, I we'll we'll get to that at BYU okay. but that but it's present in this timeline yeah as well. that's when that principle was introduced to me like oh like something I've been doing since I was like 10 or 11 like because I went through puberty very early um started my period very early um and I just didn't even know what this, what that was, what, what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, um, and it was such a like soothing thing to me as a depressed kid. Like it's something that helped me relax. Yeah. Um, especially like, you know, I, I would cry myself to sleep all the time <laughs> and was just miserable. And it was like this, this well, thing. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, and then I learned that it was bad. So I really worked hard through high school to not do that. Um, but it, well, and this, this is the thing. It's like things were really great. It's almost like my Mormon life before I was baptized was kind of better <laughs> than my Mormon life after I was baptized. Cause there's, foreshadowing. there's an element there that was missing. Mm. And that was like these kinds of worthiness interviews. I didn't have to deal with that when right. I was a dry Mormon I didn't have any bishops interrogating me about my behaviors. And that only began after I was baptized. Exactly. So mm. things exactly. really yeah. started going downhill after I was baptized because mm. there was, there were, because I, once I was baptized um, and, and we'll get there, but, but we're going to, we're going to experience temple stuff mm -hmm. Um patriarchal blessing, which set like kind of new expectations, um, and, uh, worthiness interviews, ecclesiastical endorsements, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Okay. Um, but in high school I was not, I was complete, completely unaware yeah. of that. Like any changes that I made in my life, it was like, I was accountable to me and to God. Mm. I would repent of my sins. I would, I would change my habits. I would, begin new habits such as daily scripture study and praying twice a day. Yeah. Um, and I was only accountable to me and God. Mm -hmm. There was nobody else who was like, are you doing this? Say <laughs> yes or no. Are you doing this? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just like, I was just able to sort of manage my own, um, worthiness. And I, I had very like, you know, I've established, I had very high standards for myself. Um, so I was doing pretty well overall, I think, but, but it was, um, 
you know, I, I stopped wearing uh, sleeveless clothing. <laughs> this is really funny. My Mormon friends mentioned at some point that Mormons wear white underwear. And I know that they're referring to garments now, but at the time I didn't know that. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get rid of all of my floral panties and I need to buy white bras. And I did. I went and I bought white panties and white bras. And as a not yet baptized woman. Yeah. I was only allowed to wear white underwear, from what I understood. Wow. I was so um, easily influenced. I was just like a sponge. Anything that they said I would do, anything. Yeah. I just, like anything. Mm. I was, I believed anything and everything that they said. Mm. <laughs> I was just eating it up. Um, yeah. So yeah, and I would go shopping with my one of my best my other best friends who lived on my block who was not Mormon and she was baffled observing me making these changes in my life cuz like we would go clothes shopping together and it's like okay last year we were buying tank tops together and this year you're not and then like, wait, last year you would sleep over at my house on Saturday night and this year you won't because you're breaking the Sabbath. Like what the hell, you know? Mm -hmm. um, she was like so baffled and she's like, you're doing all of this for Stan. And that's, that's also a reputation that I started getting. My sister started saying that too. Like um, people were like, Liz is just trying to be Mormon because she's in love with Stan. Mm -hmm. um, she just wants, she's trying, you know, that was, that was, and, and I think that that was actually a part of it. Mm -hmm. That was an element for sure. Yeah. Um, because it's I knew normal. he wouldn't date me if I weren't Mormon. Yeah, Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Do you have a, so you kind of were speaking earlier that that you started to have the, having this dream form in your mind around Stan. Uh huh. Um, so was Stan, do you think ever aware of that? Oh, definitely. And I think he was sort of flattered. Mm. Um, but he also was in love with another Mormon girl. Okay. Um, and I was so jealous of her mm. and I started to like try to be her <laughs> mm. as well, but I could never be her because she was white. We didn't get into this yet, but in the Book of Mormon, there are quite a few verses. Well, the whole thing mm -hmm. is very, there, there are two like racial groups. <laughs> there are two tribes that look different. You have like the dark skinned Lamanites and the white skin. We all know in this room that this is some problematic stuff in the, uh, the scriptures, these lines about, um, you know, dark and loathsome f and filthy people. Versus the white and delightsome. The white Nephites. and exceedingly fair and beautiful. Um, I have like these, they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome um, that they may not be enticing. All right, let's yeah. see. They may not be enticing unto my people. The Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. So God made Lamanites in the Book of Mormon dark so they would mm -hmm. appear repugnant yeah. to the white Nephites, right? Yeah, and then cursed shall be the seed of him that mixes with their seed. And that was something that my friends also mentioned, that mm -hmm. they're like, well, Liz, like, I hate to break it to you, but like Mormons mm -hmm. usually don't uh, mix, well, Mormons don't marry non-Mormons. And because you can't get married in the temple to a non-Mormon. And then um, they didn't phrase it like that. They don't the, mix races. That they don't mix races, yeah. but they would phrase it like it's discouraged to like marry someone of a different culture because <laughs> you won't like, you won't like identify with each other, or connect with each compatible. other in the same way. Yeah. You might, yes, you might not be as compatible if you're from different wink, wink <laughs> cultures. <laughs> oh. Oh. So, and I like, so that was also such a bummer because like, no matter what I did, I would never look like the girls that Stan seemed to be interested mm. in. And so I thought like, well, maybe, maybe I could win him over with my domestic skills. If I, if he can see how good a cook I am, how good a seamstress I am, um, how I can knit, how I can do all these homemaking skills, like 
I, you know, I was good at everything. You'll overcome your dark skin. I don't know. Basically. Like just to fit, like whatever's, whatever he was looking for, I was trying to be. Yeah. It's like, I can earn that love. <laughs> yeah. I'll hustle for that love. And so my uh, senior year, I was still, was I still? No, no, no. Okay. My junior year, because he, my junior year was his freshman year at BYU. And <sighs> even though I was 15, prom, the junior prom, or the junior senior prom was combined. Prom was like four or five days after, or before my 16th birthday. I was going to be 15 for the prom. <laughs> and I was like, panicking. <laughs> like, I just want to go to the prom, but I'm not allowed to date until I'm 16, which is a rule that I applied to myself. Um, and I made those a couple of exceptions, but that last one, that Sadie Hawkins with that boy who put his hand in my pocket, that was bad. You know, I'm not going to do that again, but I was like, this is my one chance to like go maybe like express my feelings to Stan. Stan. And so I wrote to him or we were chatting online on like AOL instant messenger. And, um, I asked him it when he was finishing his semester at BYU and it was going to be like a few days before the prom in Colorado Springs. And I asked if he would, I, I asked him to the prom. I asked him if he would go to the prom with me and he said, yes. And he made an effort to drive, back from BYU, like right after his finals so that he can be there. But I was like, this is it. This is my first date with Stan. Like, finally, mm. we're going to the prom together. So you went with Stan to, to senior prom? To my junior prom. Okay, junior prom. He was just okay. finishing his freshman year. Got it. Before his mission. Yeah. He he just finished his first year, and then he was going to go leave on his yeah. mission that summer. So you got a date with Stan. I got one date was Sam <laughs> um, before he left on his mission and he, he knew how much I liked him and he, he was so generous and just like, and knew it was my first prom and just like made it really special. He wasn't like, clearly he wasn't like super into me, but he like, we were friends. He, he always saw me as a friend. I was always a friend and he, he did care about me and we, we always like, you know, wrote emails to each other and notes to each other and, and, um, so like he did care about me as a person, but he wasn't like romantically interested, but he made sure that I had a great night. And, um, Oh, where was I, I was going to say about, about that. Um, well, you were, you were talking about not being the right, not being white enough. Oh yeah. Being a domestic um, goddess to make him happy. Yes. Oh yes. I made my prom dress. <laughs> like I was like, if Stan doesn't want to like, proposed to me over the quality of this prom dress. I don't know what's wrong with him. I made I from security. I, yeah, I designed and made from scratch a Renaissance style dress Wow! with like fluttery sleeves and a corset, like a corset, like a, a lace, lace up thing. Like I learned how to do eyelets to make this dress. That is amazing. And, um, I like, even like sewed like this colored ribbon into these braids, like these oh. little into my hair. Like I was like, if this doesn't win him over, will anything, <laughs> you know? And he was so impressed with my dress. Everyone was, um, at the same time, I'm remembering that while I was making this dress, I had a terrible experience with my dad and, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this, but this just sort of like maybe emphasizes like kind of how, how things were at home versus how I felt with my Mormon friends in their homes. But I like left the iron on that I was using to like press the pieces of fabric as I was sewing and I left it on and my dad got really mad about the iron and was yelling, yelling at me from across the house. And this was probably one of the worst things that happened, but um, but, but he, he was, he yelled at me. I came, I was like, what's going on? And he was like, you left the iron on, you could burn the house down. And he took the iron and he pressed it on my hand, um, so that I could feel how hot it was or like understand the severity of the situation or something. And it was like, 
horrible, obviously. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I went to school that day and was just fighting back tears all day and like kind of just like touching my red hand all day. And like, and my dad felt bad about it. And he like called and invited me to go out to lunch with him and he wanted to make it up to me. And I said, no. Um, But, Mm -hmm. and then later that evening he was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I should have explained that in a better way. And then he like, as an engineer, he like drew me a picture of like how irons work and like electrical current. And I was like, this is how I should have explained it to you. Like how a thing, something like that can overheat. Um, and he was very apologetic, but that was just like one example of how he would lose his temper and lash out at me. And, um, hmm. I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then like my Mormon friends, parents were just like, so not, that way they were so just different (laughs) but um you know like so I was taking these AP classes around the same time that I'm like I'm gonna be a domestic goddess and marry Stan um one of my my AP history teachers she was like the most um her class her AP history class was like known as the hardest class at our school and I took it and I did well um, and she was so impressed with my writing. Um, actually Stan was the one who inspired me to start a journal cause he had a journal and he kind of told me that like Mormons keep journals, you keep your personal history. It was almost like a part of the religion, the religious practice to journal. Yeah, sure is. Um, so I started a journal and, um, that was also that, you know, I said earlier was my, um, that was where I went to, to tell people, tell the person who wasn't there, how my day went. (laughs) Um, And so I became a really strong writer because I would write like hours. I can imagine. I I wrote a lot. In fact, my dad grounded me from my journal. (laughs) Mm. Like, like uh, one of my favorite movies or stories, it's also a book, but Harriet the spy. I love that movie. And it's um, young uh, Harriet is grounded from her journal because because she's writing mean things about her friends, but I was grounded from my journal because I was staying up late and um, like writing when I was supposed to be sleeping. Mm. Um, So my dad took my journal away for a while and I just wrote on like loose leaf pieces of paper and then like taped them into my journal when I got it back. But anyway, I was a really strong writer and my AP history teacher noticed this and she like read aloud one of my uh, essays to like our classmates and And then she like pulled me aside after school one day and she's like, Liz, like, what are your plans for the future? Like, what are you thinking in terms of college and stuff? And I think it was a junior, this was junior year. And I was so into this Mormon stuff. Right. And I told her, I was like, I'm not sure I want to go to college. I think I want to get married and have kids. And she introduced to me what the Mormons would say to me too, which is, well, in case something happens to your husband, it's, it would be good for you to have an education too. And I was like, yeah, okay. And then, and then I was like, yeah, I'll go to BYU then. (laughs) If I go to college, I'll go to BYU. And, um, and then uh, my senior year, I did. I applied. I applied to, or I applied to BYU. And um, although I was really strong as a visual artist in painting um, and drawing, watercolor, oil, acrylic, and cartooning, actually, I, I, I took lessons as a doing caricature art. You know, when you go to like the circus or the fair, and somebody does caricatures. I actually had like a mentor and learned that style. And then my dad um, had me take cartooning lessons. And I had this dream to become like a comic strip writer. I was super obsessed with Calvin and Hobbes. Mm, and, so good, um, yeah. <laughs> and then I wanted to be, or like a Disney animator. Um, I, one, of the, or one or both of those things. I wanted to be a cartoonist. And that's still my strongest um, skill in arts is like line, cartoony line drawing is my strength. Um, so I thought that I would go to school to study visual art, but then by the time I was a senior, I was, you know, winning these all state first chair spots, um, on string bass. 
and realized like that's probably my best um, chance to getting into school uh, or get, getting a scholarship, getting a scholarship. So um, I auditioned at um, it CU Boulder, Colorado University, Boulder, um, the whichever school is in Greeley, Colorado, UNC, University of mm-hmm. Northern Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, people who go to those schools are like, ah, who, you don't know. <laughs> um, I got off uh, and I submitted a, a VHS tape audition to the BYU Music School. Which and is quite prestigious, as I it understand. It is. Yeah. It's very, yeah. it's a good music school. Yeah. It is good. And I got offered scholarships to all of those schools on first string bass wow. um, performance. And I just knew, I was like, my dad's never going to let me go to BYU. Because he's he was going to pay for my schooling. And I was like, he would never, you know. But then I approached him with my college acceptance letters and he was so cool about it. And again, by this point, he was kind of like, well, I can't, I can't talk mm-hmm. her out of this at this point. She's just too, she's too deep into it. And he was so cool about it. He like, he was like, okay, let's, uh, let's draw up a little, let's do some math here. Let's see which is the most affordable. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> so he, uh, but again, my first year, I didn't get that like deduction or that, that discount that you get when you're actually a member of the church. Oh yeah. Member deduction. Because again, I was younger. So my first year at BYU, I was 17 the entire year. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm. I don't, um, so anyway, my dad, we're, we're, he's just, he's doing the math by hand. He always did that. We calculators, bah, he, he, he sent me to school for show and tell in elementary school with a slide rule saying like, show your, show your friends the slide rule. That's how we, that's how you do math. You know? That's how it's done. <laughs> or like by hand. So he was like by hand with a pencil writing out all the numbers for these, the various schools, the tuition, the approximate cost for books, um, housing, et cetera. And then, um, and adding it all up. And I think things came out pretty, um, like pretty evenly, but he had expressed I was the youngest. He had expressed that he wanted my, my sister had moved to New York and my brother had joined the air force Academy and graduated and was kind of off in the world at some other, he was, he was off doing the air force thing stationed somewhere else in the United States. I can't remember where at the time, but, um, he was like wanting me to stay in Colorado in case something happened to him. And, uh, but I was like, no, what? No, I'm going to Utah. I'm going to the promised land. I can't stay here. (laughs) And like, again, I had this relationship with him where I didn't want to stay there. I knew that when I left home, I was never coming back. Mm. I didn't want to go back ever. And um, so I was like, no, I, I want to go to BYU. And he was like, okay. Mm. Okay. And so I accepted and that was my future that would be my future so the way i want to end this first part is with your baptism mm, unless okay. that unless that, that goes no, that far into your byu experience uh well how much longer should we make segment one we should wrap up pretty quick we're at two we're at 215 okay so, so yeah. we should not because that... not we're in any hurry we just want to make these bite-sized chunks yeah so. yeah no, the, the first year at BYU is an interesting experience. So I think, I think, Maybe, um, just graduating high school is probably okay, a good okay. way, place to end. Um, okay. uh, I'm trying to think what else I might toss in from this time period and my experience with the Mormons. <laughs> So when, when you were just to maybe jog your memory, but also, so as you're graduating, um, Stan is on his mission. He is left right? on his mission that summer. Yes. And okay. I decided that I would write him like every week. <laughs> and I told him this and he's like, he, he tried to tell me like, you know, chatting on AOL instant messenger, which I think is against the rules. Is it? Oh yeah. no, no, no. He wasn't on his mission yet. Just oh, before okay, he okay, left, okay. we're chatting and he's like, Liz, 
there are other fish in the sea. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, but none like none you. None that compare <laughs> there are to no the fish likes that are like you. you. Stan. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and he's like, you don't need to write me on my mission. I'll be, mm. he was like trying to explain like, I'll be very busy. Mm. I'll be very busy. Mm. And I was like, no, I will write you. <laughs> I will write you. And so he left that summer, the summer before I went to BYU and I did start writing him. But here's a teaser for the next episode. This, I was so excited that he went, was called to serve his mission in Hawaii oh. with Polynesians with brown skin like me. Mm. Mm. And it occurred to me that if he could learn to love those people, he might be able to look past what I looked like Aww. and love me too. Mm. Look past. That's just so <laughs> telling. Yeah. Uh, I thought you were going to say he got called to South Korea and he converted your mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But your story's better. Uh, is there any? Yeah. Um, that's a really good cliffhanger because like does Liz date stand at BYU does Liz get baptized at BYU and then what's her BYU experience like when she comes to Oz what's Dorothy yes. comes to Oz Oh, and uh, I triggered something once Dorothy comes to Oz gets baptized and now has to have the worthiness interviews has the full experience and the full mm -hmm. Mormon experience and that's going to be part two. Yeah. Um, and then part three is going to be your deconstruction. But what yeah, did I, okay. What did, a couple did, quick things. Okay. Um, you reminded me. So I, I began to like sort of sense, you know, as I was 15 and 16, that maybe there was a little difference between like Mormon culture and like Mormonism, <laughs> Mormonism. Doctrine. Um, and, and it really like, Became, I, my, it was brought to my attention when my friends, we had a movie night and we watched the movie Singles Ward mm -hmm. and they were all like laughing at all these little funny inside, inside jokes. jokes. Yeah. And I found it like truly offensive. Mm -hmm. I was like, this religion is, is, means more than the world to me. And you're laughing at it. You're laughing. <laughs> You're making jokes about things that are so sacred to me. How can you be like that? I, I, it was like beyond me. I just, and that's when I realized like, wait, there, I'm missing something here. These were, yeah, like the inside jokes that I wasn't quite getting. Mm -hmm. um, making, making light of spiritual things. Yeah. yeah. It, it was so distasteful to me. <laughs> and little did I know that's like what BYU, like that's like the essence of BYU. But before though, before I went to BYU, I did a campus visit with my brother and my, my older brother drove me to Utah. And this was my first time in Utah when I went to visit BYU for the campus tour and to meet who would become my base professor one of the most cherished people in my life who still, we're still very close. Um, and my brother and I drove out there and I remember I was so excited. I was so excited to see Utah, see this place where Brigham Young brought the people. <laughs> and as we drove into the state, I started seeing them. I started seeing the churches, so many churches, identical churches, just dotting the skyline all across the horizon. The closer we got to Provo, the more there were, they were, they were it just Mormonism in abundance, churches left and right. <laughs> like, oh, I was like, this is, this is heaven. This is the promised land. Like, this is it. Emerald City. <laughs> I was like blown away. Like, you know, the, there were, there are actually quite a lot of, quite a, quite a, there's a substantial Mormon population in Colorado Springs, Colorado Springs. Again, it's like a, became a very conservative Christian Republican city. Um, and the Mormons were part of that. So it was a, it was a good place um, where there was pretty decent Mormon population, but Utah. Oh my. Oh, heaven help us all. Utah was something else. And so, we got to campus and I get in like a golf cart with my brother 
and they're going to take us around BYU and talk to us. And this, the tour guide made this little comment. Um, <laughs> he was like, and of course, this is a great place to find your eternal companion. Hmm. And my brother was like, what is he, what is he talking about? Like, you're not going, you're, you're 17. And <laughs> I think I was actually, I was probably still 16 cause I turned 17 right at the end of my senior year. And, uh, he's like, what is this dude talking about? Like my little sister, my littlest sister. And here's this tour guide telling me that talking to me about finding my eternal companion at BYU, like that cultural element I did not, I didn't, I don't think I realized it too. Like how big a part of the BYU experience would be in terms of this is the place where you will find your eternal companion. Literally why I went. Cliffhanger. And I found her. Oh, amazing. (laughs) At BYU. Anyway. So will Liz find her eternal (laughs) companion at BYU? We shall see. Have you seen the musical Wicked? Yeah. Like I just had the, just the realization that this idea of Alphaba with a skin color that wasn't, yeah, you know, going to Oz to meet the wizard uh, to finally yeah. fit in. I don't, I'm not trying to force that narrative on you. No, it's, but, it's very much. It's, yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but I don't think that even crossed my mind the one time that I did see it. I would love I you to. So, I was so like distracted by the music. I would love you someday. I would go take you to see. <laughs> go see Wicked. See Wicked. Have you kind of fit yourself into Elphaba's uh, character? Yeah. Have her going to Oz, meeting the wizard, expecting to finally be loved and accepted. Yeah. And then eventually empathizing with the groups that are um, being harmed. And then becoming disenchanted with uh are you with, giving with too the much wizard away are you i giving don't know too much away? <laughs> anyway <laughs> i just had to throw that in better stop there John. <laughs> okay better well that's there. the so that's the teaser this ends part one of our amazing interview with liz lampson thank you liz oh, for part welcome. one Great thank you margie combo. for writing shotgun absolutely and uh that's just part one part two is going to be liz's experience at byu and her experience uh if she finds love and if she has kids and if she tries the devout Mormon route, uh, that will be part two. It's going to be really good. <laughs> it's so uh, there's some really juicy stuff in the, in, in part two. So don't miss it. It's a ride. It is a trip. And then part three will be your faith deconstruction and reconstruction. If that exists. I Yeah. I would say, you know, as a little teaser for part three, it's sort of like, you, well, you know from my introduction that I have five children and it's uh, when we decided we were done and then kind of like, whoa, mm-hmm. what have we created? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did we get here? Yeah. And what is the future going to look yeah. like now that we have five kids? Now that you're in it. Now that we're living it. And you are kind of premiering a song. Do you want to mention that really oh, quick? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I wrote a song, and I. it's called Never Too Soon. But I think I probably want to dive more into, like, the the nitty-gritty of what prompted me to write it and what it's about. But I just wanted to do a teaser to let people know yeah. we're going to be, in part two or three, we're going to be premiering a song yes, that you yes. wrote. Yes, so I wrote an original song. Um, yes, this will tie in definitely more with part two because it's when I, it's, um, there's a new dream that comes in, which is to be like a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it's a, it's a song called Never Too Soon. And it's, it's sung or told from the perspective of the baby Moses. And it's, it's about, um, his relationship with his mother and, and the church, the Mormon church is represented by his mother. They have a very meaningful connection, a very real connection. Um, but 
they do part ways. All right. Well, uh, so those are the teasers. So thank you for joining us for part one of our interview with Liz Lampson. And we hope you will join us for parts two and three. Uh, they're going to be epic. So thanks, Liz. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Margie. And thanks, viewers and listeners, for joining some warmer stories. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. We're about, we're trying to hit 100,000 subscribers and your subscriptions can help us put us over the mark. The reason why that's important is because it helps with the algorithm. It helps let people, it helps people want to come on Mormon Stories when they see that we have a large subscription base. And subscribing uh, notifies you when new episodes come out. So for all those reasons, please hit the subscribe button. Please follow us. And you can do the same on Facebook. And we just appreciate everyone who supports Mormon Stories to make this all possible and everyone in the staff and the board that make it possible as well. So be good to each other, be kind to each other, and we'll see you all for part two of our interview with Liz, Liz Lampson. Thanks, everybody.